This is Winchester Academy. Welcome with me, Officer Sarah Baseboog and her partner, Falco. Now it's on, right? Yes. Okay. I'm not a good microphone person, but I'll try. Um, I'm Sarah. I'm Sarah Stoffer, probably to many of you, but I, um, because we ask people to give us their legal names on the street, at one point the department said, you all have to use your legal names too, so I had to change my name to my married name. So I'm Sarah Baseflug. I work for the Madison Police Department. I have been there since May of 2007, so just a little more than 10 years. Um, I have been assigned, well I suppose I'll back up, I was a 2000, this is Falco, he's very, very vocal but very friendly. Um, I graduated from Wapaka High School in 2001. I went down to UW-Madison where I received my bachelor's degree in social welfare and criminal justice. From there I was hired in Shawano County by their social services and I did child protective services. I was there for two years and decided that it wasn't for me, I liked the work, but I wanted more. I had also made friends with many of the officers that were there and had a, an opportunity to kind of get to know them. And one officer in particular, Jody Johnson, um, she was a foster parent as well as a police officer. So I saw how she was able to do the social work aspect and the law enforcement aspect, and I liked the way she put the two together. And I thought, well, if she can do it, why can't I? So 10 years later, here I am. Um, I decoyed for the K-9 unit for seven years prior to becoming a handler, just in January of last year, January 2nd. Um, that means that I was a chew toy. So I will show some videos later of what being a chew toy means in the K-9 world. Um, K-9 Falco is a dual purpose patrol dog. He is a German Shepherd Belgian Malinois mix. So he is not purebred. Um, we've is anybody afraid of dogs particularly in here? And it's okay if you are, the fear is real sometimes. He is super friendly, so if he comes to say hi and you don't want him, shoo him away. He might see you, he'll probably stay up here the whole time, but being on a leash, he thinks he's working. Um, so the thought is German Shepherds are very, very sharp dogs. They're, they very much want to please. Belgian Malinois are off the charts crazy. Their prey drives and their drive to work is insane. You, those are the dogs that you can see scaling a 12-foot wall, um, jumping over anything that comes in their way. They're nuts. So they bred the two of them, and I think that it, it's a good mix because you combine that drive with the sharpness of the shepherd. So you'll see he's right now, because I have a uniform on and because he has his collar on, he thinks he's working and he's going to get to do something really fun. Um, but normally Falco is just like your everyday pet. Um, I hate calling him a pet because my sergeant would get on me and say, he's a working dog. But at the end of the day, um, Falco comes home with me and he has to learn to live in my house and I wouldn't tolerate this craziness. So um, he was imported from the Czech Republic. He was born June 7th of 2011. And from there, uh, Kennel in North Carolina, Tar Heels Kennel in Sanford, uh, went over. Then they bring over lots of dogs every year. And they specialize in police dogs, um, Handler, or protection dogs, protection animals, service animals. So he came over into the United States where he stayed there until late in 2012. They did all of his imprint training, meaning when we picked him up, he knew his narcotic odors. He had some tracking and his apprehension work or aggression work um, was imprinted already. He came over and originally he was paired with Officer Rose Man Savage. Um, Rose in last year, in decided that she wanted to move on with his, her career. Um, Falco was only four years old, and because of the time commitment and the financial commitment, they decided, and Madison Police has never done this before, that they were going to reassign him back into the unit and pick a new handler for him. Um, this dog was bred to work. He wants nothing more to do than to get in that car every day and go to work. 
Um, so they, they decided that it, it wouldn't be good for him to just be a stay-at-home dog. They had so much invested in him. The military does it all the time. It is not very widely done in the police world because most officers, when you get into the canine unit, you want to stay there. Um, I have every intention of working the rest of my career in this unit. Uh, he, so that being said, he had four years on the street and I had no years as a canine handler on the street. So this dog was working circles around me. Um, I, I'm very confident in my ability to be a patrol cop. I was not very confident in my ability to have to take care of somebody else and be a patrol cop. So we spent six weeks in training together, which is pretty standard. When you go to the kennel, typically people will go to North Carolina and they stay there for six weeks. So you're away from your family, you're away from uh, uh, everything you know. You can come home on the weekends if you want to, but who wants to drive back and forth to North Carolina? Because I can tell you the department is not putting the bill for a plane ticket. Um, so he and I were lucky enough, we got to stay in Madison with a couple of master trainers, not master trainers, excuse me, trainers there. Uh, and then we, our, our unit decides that we're gonna certify annually these dogs. It's not forced, but our department does it just so that when we go to court with these dogs, we can say, we certify annually. And the test is worse than any test I've ever taken in my life. You have to pass it with a 91%. So they set out 18 narcotics fines. If you miss one, you fail. So we, <laughs> well, excuse me, you get to miss one. Anyone after that, you fail. So you get 17 out of 18. And it's a, it, the test happens in Michigan. We went with master trainer Mike McHenry at FMK9. He was very friendly with us because he knew that Falco knew what he was doing. It was me that was trying to catch up. <laughs> so, um, canine Falco's primary language is Dutch, and most of our unit has now gone to, I think only one dog is left behind speaking German yet, but it's just so that all the handlers can, can, can communicate with each other's dogs. Uh, is there a reason we do that? Can any bad guy go and look up what the word to go get somebody, find somebody, do whatever they want in Dutch? Certainly. But it gives me an, an advantage and a marker word for him that it means nothing to anybody else. So it's just a way for he and I to communicate. He is, like I said, dual purpose. So we are assigned to patrol. Right now we're riding the afternoon shift, 2 p.m. to 10 p.m. In January we will go back to the night shift. Everybody probably cringes at that. I'm really excited. That's where I came from. The first six years of my career, I rode the night shift before becoming a neighborhood officer in the Northport Drive um, corridor. So now here I am in January 2017. I was given a leash and a dog. Um, what does that mean? Falco and I go to work every day. It, it's amazing to me when he's at home. He wants nothing more than somebody to throw him his magic Kong. And he will bother you about it until you pick it up and throw it. But at any rate, he's a fantastic home dog. He loves my kids. I have a one and a three-year-old. He, he knows when he's at home and he knows when he's at work. And the bond that's created between a handler and a dog is nothing that I ever imagined it would be. As you can see him sitting here staring, every move I make, he will follow me around. Will he stand this down? Maybe. I haven't told him to. But he's very concerned about what I'm doing. And that's one thing I appreciate most about him, uh, is that I know he will protect me as, as much as he can. He will do whatever he can to help me out. Uh, and when we go to work, so I have, he has a prong collar on right now, that he, control collar, that he doesn't wear at home. The minute he hears that come out and jingle, he knows it's work time, and his demeanor changes. He goes into this kind of almost, almost a militaristic, like, what are we going to do? What, you know, what do you want me to find? How do you want me to do it? Tell me what to do. It's, not a, it's, it's no longer a play drive for him. I know people who know us outside of work have seen us when we're working, and he doesn't pay them any attention. My husband's also an officer, and we've seen him um, while we're at work, and he literally blows right by him without a care in the world. See you later. Maybe I'll check you when you get home. Um, but that being said, my husband, I think my son, so his alpha world is me, my son, and then my husband. He almost sees my husband as like, don't, you know, don't get in the way of this. I, I, got, I got her. Don't, you don't need to help us here. <laughs> so he really, he, he doesn't, at work he could care less about him, but at home he is just a big old teddy bear. Um, let's see. Um, some of the things that he does while he's at work. Uh, the, the biggest thing is he will sniff for narcotics. So these dogs are, our dogs are trained in five odors, marijuana, heroin, cocaine, crack cocaine, and methamphetamines. 
Um, when he alerts on one, it's one of the five. He doesn't have like a special raise your right arm if it's marijuana, your left arm if it's cocaine. He sits and he stares. And um, so that being said, we work a lot with the Dane County Narcotics and Gang Task Force. And I know some people around here, my mom particularly was saying, Opeka rated fourth in the dangerous cities to live in. Who knew? Um, but I do, and I'm aware that there is somewhat of a drug problem here like everywhere. Heroin is a, an incredible epidemic right now, and it's very sad. It's terrorizing families from all walks of life. It doesn't matter who you are, and there are probably more than one person in this room where opioids have affected your family or your friends in some way, shape, or form, currently or in the past. Um, and that is really sad. So one thing that he and I are doing is working with the Narcotics and Gang Task Force and all of our dogs, so there's eight dogs that are assigned in the Madison Police Department. Seven of them are dual purpose like he is. One is an explosives only dog. We also contract out with a cadaver dog um, business. She happens to handle one of our dual purpose canines as well. So we have three cadaver dogs that will come out and help in those kind of situations. So for narcotics, um, we're mostly sniffing vehicles. We don't sniff people, we never sniff people. Um, his bucket of narcotics is right there. It's almost as if he knew. Um, <laughs> so, come on. Um, a lot of times we'll get a call from task force saying, hey, you know, we're, we're involved deep in this drug investigation. Get on the belt line, if anybody's familiar with the belt line in Madison, it's the main thoroughfare, and start heading east. Okay, where should we go next? We'll just wait till we stop this vehicle. So they stop a vehicle, and what they want is him close by because state law says that you can't extend a traffic stop or prolong a traffic stop just to get the canine there. So if you're just going to write a ticket, and you write the ticket and you're done, and canine's still 20 minutes away, you're not sniffing that car. It's an unlawful detention. So they like when the canines, we, ha we have about two working every shift, are close by so that we're there, they stop a car, we can get out and we can sniff it right away so that they can move on and they're not prolonging or um, unlawfully detaining anybody. So Falpo will either hit on a car or not hit on a car. And I almost like it better when he doesn't hit on cars because it confirms that he's not just false alerting on everything that's out there. We do a lot of training with our dogs where we'll set up four or five vehicles in a row and Half of them will be blank cars, there's nothing in them, and some of them will have drug finds in them. And so, if your dog's false alerting on a blank car, you've got a problem. Um, we see that, you know, I'm lucky that I have so many people around me that love to do this, that they'll help me train, so we're getting a ton of training hours. We don't see too many false alerts. Um, and his training records then, I'm responsible for keeping all of those and dumping them all in the software so that someday when I go to court I can say, no, he doesn't just hit on every car we walk around. I can show you, I can prove to you. The other thing that we're doing is we're setting out proofing items. So um, we'll set them out in boxes quite often and it'll have dog treats. Our sergeant's mean and he'll go and buy McDonald's so it's steaming hot and fresh in that box. If your dog hits on the McDonald's, well, better start training again. Uh, tennis balls, tug reward toys, cat food, cat litter, uh, just about anything you can think of we're proofing our dogs off of. We go to the bank and we'll get uncirculated cash money so that um, our, our dogs will alert on money that's been involved in drug transactions just because people are carrying that odor on their hands. So as they handle their money, they're transferring it. Their noses are, I can't remember the exact number, but like 6,000 times more sensitive than the human nose. Where you and I look around to find things, and that's, that's our main way of finding our way through the world, their noses are their, are their paycheck. Um, so that being said, my husband's really upset because we can no longer fertilize our yard. <laughs> so we have to have the best dandelions in the town. Um, it doesn't bother me, but all that fertilizer and junk up in their nose, we, we just don't know what it does to their noses and to their um, ability to, to sniff. So he hits on a car. Task Force, uh, or anybody, and he hits on a car, or he hits on anything. We can search the interior of that vehicle, including the trunks, the whole passenger compartment. It's questionable whether you can search the occupants. Some people say that if the person was sitting in the car, well, you have more probable cause to search the person than two. There's also some language in our statutes that say, well, if that person had enough time to sit in the car before you took them out to sniff it, 
Did they dump everything in their pockets and say, well, I'm not going to let you search me? So we like to try and come up with a different way. We love to get consent from people to search. Um, but the canine sniff does get us into the cars and get us the search on it when somebody says, you aren't searching my car. Um, our department's stricter in our policy than state statute, so we actually have to have a reason other than I'm just going to walk my dog around your car to see if he alerts. Uh, so the, like task force, they're, they're into these big drug investigations, so they'll have some reason that they believe that the person that they've stopped may or may not have drugs in their car. The post office is another one. We do a lot of sniffs for them, believe it or not. They'll watch packages, and if they have an address, lots of them coming from Colorado or the western states, frequenting back and forth, they'll pull packages and they'll have us run our dogs past them. Falco had a recent uh, $30,000 cash fine at the post office from an uh, interstate drug issue. Get out of there. Um, so I really, the, like I said, I love when he doesn't alert on things just because it's peace of mind for me that our training is, he's sticking true to his training. Um, I did set out some drug hides in this room, and just because he's crazy, crazy, we'll let him work a little bit. I tried to set one in each corner just so you can see. Um, I don't think I have it. Ready? So his word for finding drugs is souk. I guess that means search in Dutch. I've never actually looked it up because it works for us. So what I always do with him is I'll tell him to sit, and usually if it's a vehicle, we're going to start in the same spot just about every time just so I can mark my pattern and I know where he's sniffed. I do that in the same thing in rooms. I always start at a door and I work counterclockwise and then clockwise, just so I can remember in my head, hey, I didn't hit you know, the area by the American flag or I didn't, it's just making a pattern out of it so we don't miss anything. So when you think that he is in the odor of some form of an illegal drug, holler it out. <laughs> So we'll do the front room. Anybody? Oh boy. So behind, right back here, I stuck gauze that has been saturated in cocaine odor. So, <laughs> Los, Los, Los. One time somebody told me that, no, they think that he's stressed out when he's doing that. Okay, good one. Here, let's go ahead. Since we won't sniff people, we stuck one. Oh. Right, right. I'll, and I'll prove to you that he won't eat the cookies. So that one. That was marijuana. This is why we let Falco work a little bit, because then he can burn them. Los. Los. Okay. We have one more over here. For those who are going to be the other side. Nope. I might struggle with this because I didn't. Or we won't. Sometimes your canine misses. <laughs> so I would call that overpresenting. <laughs> That's called being really excited. <laughs> All right. It's hard to do some of this in a room. So. Like you'll see, when he is in odor, you'll see him really start to detail something. And it's hard. If there's a more of an open space, I can back out of his way a little bit.
But when you get close, he really starts to detail it. Detailing for me means that he's going to snick his nose against something, and he's going to work kind of in a back and forth pattern, and eventually his nose should hit source. And when his nose hits source, his butt should hit the ground. Um, so that is his trained final response. Um, So the first one was cocaine, the, mi <laughs> the middle one was marijuana, and the back one was heroin. Um, he, I don't bring drugs out in the community just because I don't want the responsibility for it. So everything that he was alerting on, and this is a um, testament to their, the sensitivity of their noses, is that um, all of that was gauze that had been soaked with source at some point. Oh. So it's just gauze pads that we soak in with drugs. We're tangled. Um, what else? Tracking. My most favorite thing to do with him, tracking. All of our dogs are sense specific. So that means that if you lost your shoe and took off out of here, he would go through this room and he would eliminate all the people that are in here. We'd use your shoe as a scent article and he should follow your odor. All of these people could walk with you and split off along the way, and eventually he would find you. Um, <coughs> humans, when we walk, criminals, when they run really fast, especially because they're dumping adrenaline, um, are constantly shedding skin cells. And so as those skin cells come off, it kind of, have you ever seen that Peanuts episode where it's like, the, um, the, what's yeah. the kid's name? He's really dirty and the cloud just keeps going and going and going. That's scent. Yes, pig pen, thank you. Um, that's scent. And so I have a video of him tracking. What you'll see him doing is that the decoy went out, and I won't bore you. If anybody doesn't believe me that he followed her path, we can watch the whole, whole video. But I think I'll spare you her laying the five minute track. Um, so what he's going to do is she laid down her gloves. I kind of cast him around the area without, he wears a tracking harness, and he's on a 15 foot lead. We don't let our dogs track off of lead. Most of the time, just because at the end of the track, it doesn't matter, missing person, bad guy, they're trained to bite that. They're, they're trained for a bite. And we don't want to accidentally bite the 11 year old kid that wandered off from home. <laughs> that would be a bad day. Um, I also don't want to, so they're tracking anywhere, Alzheimer's patients. We're doing a lot of that, a lot, lot, lot of Alzheimer's patients, medical crises, um, and kids. We track bad guys as well, and he had a track last week. Here's where I go back to the 11-year-old kid. In Madison, for some reason, the gang initiation right now is that you have to steal a car, hang on to it long enough to get into a chase with the cops because everybody knows that nobody is chasing stolen cars anymore um, just because of the liability of accidentally getting into a crash with a totally uninvolved party. Um, and get into a chase with the cops and then run and hope you don't get caught. What they don't know is that, and what bothers me is some of these kids, the last ones we caught were between the ages of 11 and 13, a carload full of four. So for us, what does that mean? Some of these kids look like they're 18. In a stolen car, if I'm the first one there, I'm gonna let them go and chase them. And then they're gonna get bit. I don't know how that's gonna play out. It hasn't happened yet and I hope it never does. Um, I, I kind of hope that this just gets squashed, but that's our gang initiation right now. So last week he had a track from a stolen vehicle, a uh, neighboring agency, Fitchburg, got into a chase with it. It got dumped in a parking lot and the kids took off running. So I started him from that vehicle and what I used for a sun article is just simply the front seat of the car where a driver was sitting. We knew there were four people. If we catch one, great. If we catch them all, even better. Um, but he, so what I do is I, I present that front seat to him, and then I'm going to cast him around the area without his tracking harness on and just let him go to the bathroom, sniff around and make sure that we're tracking the right person. <coughs> and often you'll see that he'll turn, so somewhere in that track, his intensity will pick up and he really starts to scratch at the ground and like his tail will start wagging, almost as if what we, we call it freight training, but pulling. He wants to go. Good boy. Yeah. Um, no. Uh, thank you. Yeah, well, yeah, the drugs are still there, so he'll want to go back because he thinks he's going to get his toy. Um, <laughs> so after, after we cast him around the area, and I'm certain that he's ready to work, and for him, that just means that he goes around and he knows he can have a few minutes to sort of just be a dog, and he almost takes me back to his harness then when he's like, yep, Mama, I got this. I know where we're going. 
So he took off and we went through <coughs> some big apartment complexes. He tracked around some buildings and he came to a back door. And we train all of our dogs to actually alert on doors that people have, they're looking for have gone through. So he alerted on the door, we went in, he went to a second floor apartment, and up in the second floor, he's just kind of like, I don't know, it's up here somewhere. Well, it just so happens that one of the kids that was in the stolen vehicle lives in that building upstairs. So we, he had a, a successful track. The best thing about tracking, though, the longest one that we have confirmed for our department, Karen Corcoran holds a record at five miles that she confirmed. Um, there was a homicide uh, three, fourth of July ago in the, one of the trailer parks. She tracked the suspect uh, five miles to downtown Madison from the far north side, and they actually confirmed that the guy had gone there and gotten picked up by a relative. So that was a huge success for our unit. Karen is a tracking expert. She's also the cadaver handler. She's gone to all of these search and rescue things. So she does all of our tracking training. And um, let's see, what other tracks? He, he, had a, he found a missing student the other day who decided she went home but then didn't want to tell mom where she went and she took off and went to some friend's house. So he, he was tracking her and as he was tracking her she came back to us. So I call it a find anyway because she did confirm that we were on the right path. So oftentimes we don't find anybody and a lot of patrol cops say, well, I've been on 100 tracks and we never find anybody. What they don't know, because Madison's a, a larger department, so we've got patrol, and then we've got the detective bureau, and our detective bureau's split up into all different places, is that the detectives have actually been able to use our, a lot of our tracks, and maybe we're not finding anybody, but we train car pickups. So if somebody ran and their buddy picked them up, you'll see him get into an area, and he'll just start, he, he'll check in all cardinal directions, and then he'll kind of circle his way back and lay down. Um, Detectives have been able to go back then and get surveillance video. So even if we can give them a direction of travel, we may not get more than a block and for whatever reason the dog loses the track, but at least we're giving them a direction to look at. So another homicide earlier this summer, they were actually able to catch the suspect or put a suspect together for that case when we had no leads at all, simply based on the canine coming out of a giant apartment complex and saying, I don't know where it went, but it went that way. And so checking surveillance video, they eventually found our victim and the suspect together. So it's, to me, that's a success. I don't, I don't need to find 100 people. If I can just give you a small bit of your case that cracks something open to get to the end, to give justice to some of these families, that's a success for me. If I find 100 Alzheimer's patients and no bad guys, that's a success for me. Uh, I don't, you'll hear a lot of people say, well, I want the biggest, baddest SWAT dog out there. I don't want the biggest, baddest SWAT dog because I want him to be able to come into a room of people and do this. I want him to walk around this room without a leash on and I don't have to have a fear in the world that he's gonna hurt somebody unless you pull his tail. Um, and that is the only time he's ever had issue with anybody. Some girl asked me, what would happen if I pulled his tail? And I said, what would happen if I pulled your ponytail? And she said, well, it would hurt. And I'm like, well, it would hurt. Don't do that. And she pulled his tail anyway. Um, she also pulled the tail of one of our horses, so I don't think she was the brightest boy <laughs> on the tree. <laughs> yeah, right? Yes. She, she, the horse did not take kindly to it, and he didn't take kindly to it. So um, we do train with our SWAT team quarterly usually, and for our tracking with SWAT, so if we're going to go out and we're going to track um, somebody with a potential weapons by, uh, in possession of weapons, some of the, we're getting a lot of shootings and having people run. We're gonna take as much on-duty SWAT with us as we can. Um, what SWAT does is, if you've seen the Mighty Ducks, they're gonna form a flying V right in front of us. And the dog will be out in front, but the handler, because I'm controlling the dog, I have no ability to hold on to lethal force and hold a dog. Um, so I'm gonna have somebody right in front of me, almost acting as a human shield, and he's going to be out in front saying, we're going this way, we're going that way. I have some pictures of our, <laughs> our most recent, yes, you're a good boy. Come on. Um, yeah, so I, I like to think of it as the Mighty Ducks. They're going to be out in front of us, making sure that we're safe. But at the end of the day, he's going to be in front of it all. And that, in and of itself, is enough for me to appreciate him more than anything. Um, he, our department's sort of, uh, we were formed after a, an officer was killed in Alaska doing a building search, and 
Now, it's very rare that you'll see our officers going into search buildings without putting one of the dogs in first. Is it a horrible sinking feeling as a canine handler saying to him, gee buddy, please go find this guy for us? Yeah. Um, on every one of our SWAT search warrants, I can tell you the first thing I think of is where is my nearest emergency vet clinic? Because he wears a vest, not very often because it's really cumbersome, and wearing a fur coat and a Kevlar vest, he's going to overheat in a matter of moments and we'll lose him as a tool. So we don't put our vests on them um, unless we really, really need to. So for building searches, um, he's going to go and I, I'll down him at the, the start of a building. So say we've tracked to a building. Our department says that we, before we go through that threshold, we're going to give announcements and let somebody know that we're there. Um, unless, unless there's some exigent reason that we, we, we aren't, that we think the person's armed or um, is looking to hurt us. So at that threshold of the door, I'm gonna, I'm gonna down him and say, Madison, please, if you're in this building, talk to me now, send the canine, he will bite. Um, that's gonna happen three times. And that's gonna happen throughout the building as we go, just so that I can say, I gave somebody ample warning to tell us they were in there. Because if he finds you, he's gonna bite you. And I don't wanna accidentally bite somebody. It's a lot of paperwork for me. Any bite is a lot of paperwork for me. So we want them to know, and we wanna give everybody the opportunity to tell us that they're there. Recently, he had a situation, we had a guy in a weapons fence, he tried to stab some people down the street, cops chased him to his house, we went into the house, and all it took was for us to stand, at, we knew he was in the basement, and all it took was for us to stand at the top of the stairwell and say, we've got the dog, you need to come out now, and to hear him bark, and the guy said, that's fine, I've already been bit by one of them, I'll be there in a second. <laughs> so, he came out. So we're getting a lot of peaceful surrenders, which is what we're all ultimately looking for at the end of the day. You're a very good boy. <laughs> Come on. He keeps going back to try and find his drugs. Um, I do want to show that tracking video real quick before I forget. And I will, you're, it logged out, yeah. Um, I will apologize in advance. I am not a technology person. For my generation, everybody probably thinks that I should have this beautiful PowerPoint. I don't. Um, so I will show you my videos mostly because I don't know how to do it. Um, uh, and I didn't want you to see your desktop. So what you'll see here, this is a, a video shot from a drone, buddy. Um, and you'll see my good friend Sarah Skaug, who is my track layer. This is Albert Park in, on Madison's west side, for those who are familiar with Madison. Um, and if anybody doesn't believe me, that's Sarah Skaug. She's one of our officers. Um, she's going to go and she's going to walk through Elver Park. If, and I'm not going to bore you with that. At the end, if anybody doesn't believe that he followed her path, we will watch her lay the track. It might make some, Mom was saying it might make somebody seasick. Oh, we went a little far. Hold on. There we go. So you'll see he's gone out and the drone missed him kind of catching his pre-tracking ritual where he went to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> so he's being put in a tracking harness now and his tracking harness just slips over the top of him. He's really fast and to slow him down, I track with him off the dead ring on his prong collar because he takes me to town otherwise. Um, yep, so here we go. Um, you know, it'll take just a minute for the drone to catch up. When I was talking about that scent pool, what you'll see him do, so Sarah walked this way. If she stopped or slowed down, he may stop and check that because it creates what's called a scent pool and it takes him a minute to work out of that. <coughs> Shaking is a good thing for a handler to see because that means he's saying, okay, 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 you know, it's right here, now I'm ready to go. Um, they'll catch up with him, I promise. The drone operator said, I've never tried to keep up with one of the dogs. <laughs> So we're using drones on a lot of our high-risk tracks just so that they can get out ahead of us. And then they, usually they'll find the people before we do. So you'll see him kind of work in this serpentine, hey buddy, this serpentine kind of fashion because what dogs are going to do is he's not going to stick his nose right down and just follow this path. They, come here buddy. Um, he's going to kind of work until he gets himself out of odor and then he'll come back in and he just kind of makes this serpentine flow. The way I know he's tracking is his tail. So every dog sort of has a telltale, I'm really working. His tail is stiff and it'll stay wagging back and forth. Quiet. 
So you'll see he, he'll work wood lines because as scent flows off of this hard surface, it's going to get trapped up against um, the trees and such. So any barrier, they, they'll get fixated on them often because so much scent blows up off of that hard surface. And now we're against a building and he thinks that somebody's going to pop out of a door. All right. So he's going to check all that. The way the wind was blowing, um, we're tra right now we're headed south. And the wind was blowing due east that day. So he's going to check all of that off to the side because the wind is just swooshing all that smell and scent up against these buildings. So uh, when we go on tracks, you always have to remind your backup, one, have you been running in the last like six weeks? Can you keep up with me? And if you can't, let me know now because I want somebody else to come along. There's nothing worse than having to stop and wait for your backup. Um, <laughs> and second, don't watch my dog. I know it's really cool and you want to see what he's doing, but I got him. I want you watching out on the sides of me and making sure nothing's going to happen to me. Yeah. So our policy is that most tracks, if, they're, if they have any risk to them, you're going to have at least two people off to your sides watching your back. Um, I like to think you know, Falco would take anything in the front, but um, a lot of times your backup's going to spot people first because these dogs too are going to stay true to odor. So if somebody walked to that door, walked the perimeter of this room and came right back again, he's going to take that path and be right back here again, rather than just saying, whoop, oh, nope, you're right there. So oftentimes we're getting snuck up on, on tracks. So she's down in these weeds here. Yeah, this is the other great part about being a handler. You have a lot of burdocks on you every day. <laughs> There she is. <laughs> She's got a tug toy. He's not biting her. Um, so the one other thing that we're teaching these dogs are decoys. We like them if they just kind of stay in the weeds and they don't say anything, don't move. What our goal is is for that dog's nose to be on the ground, on the ground, and whoop, there's my decoy. Um, so it's almost a surprise factor rather than air scenting and looking around just because their tracks aren't all that true then. Okay, like I said, I, uh-oh, what did I do? There it is. All right. Um, give me one minute. Who thinks there's somebody hiding in that dumpster? <laughs> So this is a building clear that Falco did. Um, every year they do a canine handler conference. They, we tracked to this building, and once we were in the building, I gave my announcements. He goes in rather than us having to go in, and at least he can pinpoint where that person is. There is actually a person in the dumpster he is standing on top of. And no, I did not put him up there. He got his way up there himself. I was all the way across the gym, and all of a sudden somebody said, uh-oh, because he leapt into the open ones. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, they're, they're a very good locating tool. They're, they love to work, and this is, what the, this is what they're driven to do. This is what they want to do. <coughs> like I said, would it absolutely be the worst thing in the world for me to send him into a building and for him not to come out with me? Yes. However, I hate to say it, he is replaceable. A human is not. So at the end of the day, he's, he's our point man, and he's going in on all of our SWAT search warrants first, He's going into any building first. He's going to be out in front of any track. And that's what I appreciate most of him about him. He's just doing it because he loves to. And he knows no different. So um, apprehensions. All right, this. So on a traffic stop, say we have a stolen vehicle and you can't see the vehicle at the moment, but it's going to be parked out in front of us. He comes out, and there's a person in that car. So this person's wearing a bite suit. Um, it looks like a giant Michelin man. If we can give orders from the car, I'm going to give orders from the car and ask that person to come out. If they're not going to come out, he's going to bring them out. So we're going to give orders, and they still don't come. And there you go. So he'll go in and 
We're training them when they bite, they're gonna bite and hold. They're not attack dogs. They're not even close to attack dogs. He's gonna target one area and he's gonna hit it and he'll hold there. Um, we train them not to munch either, just because of the amount of damage it can cause. Um, so he's trained in all non-vital areas of the body. He's not gonna take the head, the neck. He's gonna, most of the time, grab somebody in the arm or the calf area. Uh, he, he has, he likes the, to bite people in the butt. So, last week he had one and he came out and he was just hanging off of this person's butt. All right, well, that works too. So once he's on there, we're gonna let him play. And what I'm looking for now is compliance. If you're gonna be done fighting with us and you wanna give up, I'll call him off. If not, he's gonna stay and he's gonna play. With bite work for them, they know no different. They don't, he doesn't think he's hurting anybody. That's his biggest reward. Um, he thinks that he is playing. So that high-pitched whine you heard when he was playing with his tuggy toy, he does that when he's doing his bite work too. Um, he, he'll hang on until I tell him to out. So that being said, our obedience training. I train with him at least an hour a week in obedience just so that I know I have control over him. Um, he outs pretty quickly most of the time, but again, they're dogs. So with his obedience, the one thing we have to do is re be able to recall our dogs. And he might get, oh, we're not going to get sound. We didn't get the sound thing, did we? <coughs> So right here, you'll see off in the thing, there's a decoy, and I'm gonna stop him. So I gave him his bite command and I sent him. Before he gets there, he better, get, and I tell him no, if that person gives up, he better come back and be right back by my side. And then afterward, he gets a bite. Where is he, is he scaring people? Oh, okay. So the other thing they're trained in is handler protection. Um, if somebody were to attack me, he's going to come and have my back. Last week they set up a drill where we um, got ambushed in a building, so he was on a bite already, and a person came out of a closet and started attacking us, and he came flying to my rescue. Um, but that, that, I think, is the coolest thing of their obedience. I don't, did everybody catch the recall? I know that it kind of started really fast. Okay, so let me back up. Right here I'm, t I'm saying, you know, surrender, or you're going to get bit. And then I'm gonna send him, and about halfway I'm gonna tell him, nope, no bite. So I'm gonna say, no, fooey here, and he's gonna come back. So before I sent him, when he was running the first way, he had his bite command, and in his head, he was going for it. He was all in, but if I say no, he better come back and be right by my side. Um, and we do that just because a lot of people see them, and they're, not, they're sort of testing the waters. Is she really gonna send him, is she really not? Well. I'm really going to, but if you give up halfway, I'm gonna try my best to get him back to me. Um, and so his obedience training, like I said, is at least an hour a week right now. Um, and for Napwada, uh, which is the North, North American, uh, sorry, North American Police Working Dog Association, um, it's done all off lead. So <laughs> when he's a good boy, he always gets a second bite. <laughs> and that's his buddy Alyssa and you'll notice so some of our training for this we're going to get them into precarious situations like take him out of sight and what's he going to do when he's out of sight can I get him to come back to me out of sight sometimes most of the time actually So for him, um, his heel command is Vulligan. Vulligan. <laughs> and then Vulligan. Ah, Vulligan. He should, so for Napwada, he has to stay right next to me. Everywhere I turn, and if we had a larger space, they'd make us take off running and... No, Vulligan. Off. Off means down. Um, we train all of our dogs so that we can use our hands and words to talk to them. So he knows right and left in a building. I can be completely silent and somehow it, it, when he looks, I'll send him right or I'll send him left so that he can clear rooms for us. Um, so in here, we can't do that, but...
So we try and some, sometimes we're not a lot, we're not able to speak to them. Come on, come on. Off. Off. Thank you. Here. Off. At the end of the day, it's 100%. It's 100% on me to have complete control of him. Um, You're tearing my thing up again, dude. Los. His outward is los. 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 Somebody once told me that when he's making all this noise, it means that he's stressed out. And then I showed him to another master trainer, and he compared it to that tennis player. It's just him talking. He's having the time of his life. Los. Los. Yeah. Yes. Los. Serious. Thank you. Part of the other obedience training is that um, for three minutes, he has to stay in a down. And you have to walk like 15 feet from him. And you can carry on a conversation. You can confirm with him, uh-uh, blabe, stay, um, as much as you want. But he has to stay in that down for three minutes. If he breaks it, he fails. Obedience happens before every certification because our master trainer, if you can't pass the obedience, he won't test you in anything else. What else can Falco do? Uh, article searches on a lot of our tracks. So say we have somebody burglarize a place and they take off running uh, and as they go whoops my ID falls out of my pocket and I run a little further and oh there goes my phone or there goes my drugs um, Falco the word apport to him means search for the freshest human odor so he's gonna look for anything on the ground that's been discarded very recently still has human odor on it um, our dogs have found guns IDs, wallets, you name it. Unfortunately, we <laughs> always catch the bad criminals because they always lose a phone or a wallet. <laughs> and it's like, well, thank you. There's your ID. Thank you. Case closed. Uh, or your phone. Let's look up your phone number. Um, but that being said, we're finding a lot of victims' uh, belongings as well. So I think that's really neat and, uh, again, a testament to how sensitive their noses are. And in a building as well, he, if he's going to go in and somebody's hiding behind a door, he's going to alert just simply on that human odor. So people might have spent time in this room, but if nobody's in here anymore, he doesn't care about that. He's looking for that real strong, fresh human odor. Um, article searches, area searches. If we get into an area where there's super dense woods, uh, again, he's going to be our point man, and I'm going to cut him off leash, and I'm going to say, go find him, buddy, and he, he'll get his bike command. Uh, we're finding a lot of people, he had to find up in a, high up in a tree because of that. And just simply because places that we're not looking or, you know, I set my keys on the counter and I, I don't find them. Embarrassing story, recently I ran to the neighbor's house to give them something and all of a sudden I'm like, where is my phone? I had it when I left, I know I had it when I left, but all the leaves have fallen and I'm out there searching and searching. I'll go, maybe. <laughs> Ah, there's my phone in the next year, so I walked my path of travel. So I guess it is kind of nice to have a canine at home because he found my phone for me lying in the pile of weeds. Um, article searches. Perimeters, we're sitting a lot. I have a really funny picture of my super bad SWAT dog. Um, we're sitting on a perimeter here, believe it or not, <laughs> while SWAT is executing a search warrant in a house that's like right here. So Falco is kind of the takedown guy. Anybody runs, Falco's got him, right? <laughs> so that's one of our snipers, Mike. And all these guys, he, Mike actually said to me, hey, could you get your dog off of me? And I turned around thinking, oh my gosh, Falco of all dogs, hit one of the SWAT guys? And I turn around and there he is, all curled up like a tightly coiled spring. <laughs> Um, what else do we want to know about Falco? Like I said, Falco comes home with me at the end of the day, so he is like an extra right arm. I have two children and two other dogs. Falco gets along just fine with the pack. There was some concern that he wouldn't be able to live in the house with other dogs. I get more concerned when they're gone because he is 
a nutcase, and he destroys things for attention. So when they're there, at least he has somebody else to beat up on. Um, and he's actually not the alpha. Our lab is by far the alpha, which is quite funny to me. He'll be the one on his back first. So I should have named my pictures better. Like I said, I'm totally not a tech. That's my son. That's where Falco finds himself at the end of every night when we get home from work. So again, my tightly coiled SWAT dog becomes a big, big baby. There's his brother. Um, I will switch gears. Our unit is 100% supported by a nonprofit called Capital Canines. Capital Canines purchases our dogs, they purchase our squad cars, they purchase all of our training, they purchase all of our equipment, they do everything for us really. They go out into the community and they find us vet sponsors. So his sponsor is True Cell Animal Hospital on Milwaukee Street and they cover 100% of his routine care. He has a condition with his eyes where he requires a, a steroid drop every other day. I never see a bill from it. Capital Canines never sees a bill from it. So we've got some really giving people in our community. They also come out and they um, help us out in teaching how to bandage our dogs. Uh, so there, Falco is lear I'm learning how to bandage him. Vesta Dog is a group you guys have probably all heard of. Um, they're also a nonprofit. They provide all of their ballistic vests. But they also provide us this giant first aid kit that, I mean, you could solve just about any medical problem, emergency medical problem in the field you want. In Madison, we're lucky that we're a big enough community. Our EMTs come with us to training with the vets. So our EMTs are all um, knowledgeable in how to start IV lines in our dogs. They could trach any of our dogs if they really had to. Um, and just basic care to get them to the emergency vet clinics. So we, tr we try and train with them at least a couple times a year because the other part of it is they're gonna have to handle our dogs. And most of them, Falco is pretty friendly. Now he's, I've never had him knock on wood head of a serious injury and for somebody else to have to try and pin him down. Would he bite me? Maybe, and I would just take it from the rest of them. But um, we, they are training, so they're learning all, all the different holds and how to hold on to them just so that in the field, if there was ever a problem, our EMTs would know how to care for him in the interim to get him to the vet. Um, his food sponsor, believe it or not, this dog eats four cups of food a day. So we go through a lot of food. Animart is his sponsor. He gets food from them every month. Each of our dog teams has different food and vet sponsors, so all of our teams are 100% covered. Anything that's not covered by that is covered by Capital Canines. So the city, what does the city pay for, you're probably wondering. The city pays my salary, and the city pay, puts gas in our car. But otherwise, the city does not pay for anything when it comes to the canine unit. Um, they do give me a half an hour of maintenance care, so I only work a seven and a half hour shift. So I get an extra half hour for his care. Now anybody who owns a dog knows that a half an hour means nothing in your day, <laughs> especially when you've got a high drive dog. Um, but I get an extra day off a month as well then. So there are some perks. I get to take my car home. His car is set up the way it is. They pulled the whole back seat out of it and they built a kennel, giant kennel into the back. So he's got his own little house. It's got a door on it that I can let him into the front if I want. I usually don't because it never fails that you leave the car and you walk away and all of a sudden over the radio you hear this barking. <laughs> it's like, oh, would you look at that, Falco's sitting on my radio again. <laughs> so everybody always knows when the cannon handlers are around because somebody's dog is barking. Um, like I said, to sponsor a dog, so Capital Canines goes out into the community, it's a $50,000 sponsor. And what that does is it buys the dog, it buys the squad, buys naming rights for the dog. Falco came with his name from the kennel because his predecessor, Marty, went blind very early on in his career, so he was replaced by the kennel on a, under a warranty. <laughs> we don't tell him that. But yes, Falco is a warranty dog, so he just came with his name um, because Marty already had the name. So Animart sponsored him. Um, we have a lot of very generous people in our community. And they do, they, we have a, this dog paddle every year where they close down what, the pool at the end of the season and they open it up for the dogs. The fire department comes and they refill it with water. And so they, you can bring your dog and swim for the day. They do all kinds of cool things. But at the end of the day, without them, our unit wouldn't exist. Um, 
I don't know, what did we miss, Falco? <laughs> Surprise. <clears throat> when do we retire them? Good question, thank you. Well, 10, 11, recently, our, so our unit is about that old now. And so we just had our first batches of end of watch, which is the worst thing ever. Canine funerals are as bad as human funerals, believe it or not. Um, so end of watch for them, it's handler's choice when your dog retires. Uh, him, I hope, he's six. I hope that he makes it to 10 or 11 because that means I work with another dog for 10 or 11 years and I can retire, believe it or not. Um, so he, uh, it's a handler's choice, like I said. It, it's all based on their health. Their vets do a lot to keep them. We, we do chiropractic. We do all sorts of holistic stuff with our dogs, which is actually kind of cool, to try and keep them up and running as long as we can. Johnny, one of our males, he was 12, just about 12, um, when he retired. So we're seeing anywhere from 10 to 12. And when they retire, because he is actually city property at the moment, he, there has to be a financial tra transaction that takes place. Handler gets to keep the dog unless you don't want to. Um, but you can purchase him for $1, and the chief is always put at the middle for the dollar. <laughs> so he can come and retire with his handler. Um, one point I didn't touch on. Can I go back to my building searches? So I had a question for the crowd. Um, obviously, people, if somebody presented to me some sort of deadly force opportunity, I was getting attacked, stabbed, something, I could return deadly force. Do you think that's the same for our canine partners? If I, if I send him into a building and we come around the corner and somebody is attacking him, stabbing him, shooting him, applying deadly force to him, can I return? I won't anyway, because I would be in big trouble. Um, no, no, they are considered property, expendable. So I hopefully can call my dog off fast enough and out of the situation, uh, but no. And they set this drill up for officers in our academy all the time, and it never fails. Somebody returns deadly force just because it's like, well, he's on my team. Why, why am I not going to do this? But no, absolutely not. And um, could we write the report? I don't know. I, I hope and pray it never happens. But no, uh, they are expendable and property. So if anybody is big in our legislature and wants to help us change that, please, by all means, see me after this. Because I, I, yeah. Um, Why don't we open it up to Q and A? Trying to, trying, to trying to stop the threat. Yes, yeah, stop the threat. Stop it from happening. Yep. Yep. No, I'm not. Yeah. Sarah, we're going to open it up to Q and A. If Perfect. anybody has a question, wait for a microphone. One and here. before we do that, let's give her a big round of applause. <laughs> Sarah, first question. Do you, do you want to say anything about the puppies? Oh, yes. Yeah, so, um, anybody have grandchildren or small children? $15. One could be yours. I promise I will bring all the money back to Capital Canines. Um, I came here. I am actually wearing a uniform. I am not on duty. I volunteered by time 100%. I, I love doing this. I love being in the community. I don't think people realize how big of an asset and how much these dogs can do and actually how good they are at it. Um, it's hard to do a lot of things and be good at it. And I think, you know, if the appropriate amount of training and time is put into it, these dogs are knocking some of our investigations out of the park. And without them, we wouldn't be as far as we are um, with many of our cases. So if anybody wants a puppy at the end, uh, please feel free. Are any of your dogs trained in a second language? What's that? I'm sorry. Are any of your dogs trained in a second language? No. Right here. Two really quick ones. Well, the first one, it, is it fair to say that they're not biting as much as they're grabbing with what they have to grab with? Biting or grabbing with what they have to grab with? Well, you know well, what I'm saying? It's not, they're not trying to bite you. They're just grabbing you with what they have to grab with. Yeah, so if he's going to go in, I'm going to expect that he's going to grab with his whole mouth and hang on. Um, and that's why I say there's such this misnomer that they're attack dogs and they absolutely are not. Um, yeah, yep, they're not gonna grab and nip. If, he's, if I send him for a bite, his expectation is he's gonna grab and he's gonna stay there until he's outed. Um, unless environmentally he has to come off. But again, if he comes off during, and we'll set this up in training a lot where we'll get them into spots where it's like, I can't hang on anymore. 
And so he'll let go and he should re-engage in a different spot that's favorable for him. And then just say, um, you mentioned uh, other officers and they were all female names. Is it? Uh, Females in our unit? Yeah, is it predominantly females? No, 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 no. Um, I am one of two female handlers on our unit right now. So uh, you've got our sergeant, Jeff Felt. He is working his second dog. He worked a dual purpose dog and now he has our explosives only dog. Jim Donnell is on his second dog. His was one of the end, the most recent end to watch. Um, then Henry is working his second dog. Karen is working her first dog, but she also handles all of our cadaver business. And then um, the four of us lowly people on the end of the, I am the least seen here right now, so that is why I'm going back to the night shift. Um, but yes, then, then there's four other men. So two women and six men right now. But it does, yes. Sarah, I noticed that when the dog did the various things that he did, that he wasn't rewarded. It's very common when you see animals doing things that their trainers or handlers always reward them. What's the policy? Um, I'm gonna reward him, so actually on the street for narcotics, if I don't know that there's narcotics in a car, I don't reward him with his tug toy. Good boy, a treat, a tug. I like to, we, we just vary it up so that he doesn't get so focused on one thing. Like you'll notice in here, he really wants this tuggy. This is like gold to him. Um, so I try and switch it up. If he goes over there and he hits on it again, oh, good boy. And yes, you're a good boy. So it, it's very a variable reward system because I don't want him to get so focused on one thing that he won't leave it alone. <coughs> Yeah, I have a two-part question. Two part question. Uh, first, if he's tra uh, tracking somebody and it's really windy out, does he have trouble falling the scent? And if you're out and knocked out of commission, what does the dog do? Thank you, because I totally forgot to bring something up. Um, tracking, if it's really windy, is it more difficult? Absolutely. Um, it, you saw in that video, it wasn't terribly windy and I should have written down how fast the wind was blowing, but he's still, you're going to see really wide serpentine like <laughs> movements if it's super windy out. And the other thing is he may be 15, 20 yards off the track, but just because of the way the wind's blowing, whatever direction, he's going to catch what he thinks is really, really hot, fresh odor over here when maybe it's 15, the track was actually laid 15 yards this way, just because that's what his nose is telling him is the freshest odor. Um, your two-part question, sorry, am I allowed to do two parts? Yes, please. Okay, uh, your two-part question, his one and only opportunity that he and I have had for me to send him for a live bite in the real world. Uh, we had two people running from us, one of them was supposedly armed. I went to send him and as that happened, an officer got hit by a car. Um, he went down right in front of us and Falco gave up on chasing that guy and downed next to that officer. I didn't tell him to do a thing, it was one of those like, I, I'm 100% convinced that feelings run up and down a leash with him. And whether or not I popped him with his collar or something, he beelined for that cop and he laid there and he did not let anybody come near him until I came to get him. In fact, so much that the officer sat up and he, you know, he, he had a concussion and he said, uh, I think I'll just take him and take him for a walk. And I'm like, no, you're not going to take him for a walk. But he sat there and guarded him until somebody was able to help him. So. Again, that goes back to what I appreciate most about him. He's not going to let any of us down in the field. Um, and I, I'm going to try my best not to let him down. But he will probably do better than I. Do you use shelter dogs to train them as police dogs also? Canine Karani in our unit is a rescue. Uh, she's our first rescue that we've tried. She was purchased by a veterinarian whose wife thought it would be really awesome to own a German Shepherd. Little did she know that Shepherd probably came from an extensive working bloodline, and any pet owners who have a dog that chases their shadow, chases their tail, this dog needed something to do. So Canine Crony is one of our dual purpose dogs and one of our better, better dual purpose dogs. Um, so yes, we have one rescue. Karen and her cadaver work, she uses almost all rescues. Um, Crony was just a, sort of a, an opportunity that fell into our lap and they evaluated her and we trained her from nothing. Yeah, I noticed, um, are there silver cap teeth on the, on the dog here? There are. Falco I, mean, I, I noticed they were shiny, and I thought they looked like they were silver cap. Yes, Falco has a grill. Um, so Falco broke his two lower canines during training, 
And they capped, they did root canals and capped both of them to the tune of like $6,000. Um, so the second one they capped higher than the first one and anybody who has false implants and such know that you better keep them all even because one takes the brunt of it and he tore it out again. So because of the trauma the second time they pulled his entire tooth. So he only has three canine teeth. Um, most people think that they bite and lead with their canine teeth but no, most of his bite work is actually done in the back of his jaw. So. He doesn't really need them. So, um, if he's tracking somebody, <coughs> there's like a really other strong scent. Is it harder for him to track? Yes. However, when we when we train, so if we're gonna track you, and is that your brother next to you? Yeah. We're sometimes we're gonna have another person come and lay a track right across that one just so that we can train. And he might be interested in it for a little while, but he should still stick true to your odor because even though you guys are related and you probably spend a lot of time together, you smell totally different to him. <laughs> uh, I, I keep feeling that Belko understands what you're doing. Does he know you are uh, presenting a program? You are, I'm sorry. I think so. For one, he knows that we're doing something that involves work because he's staying still and he's very, you'll see that he's very focused on everything I do. Um, Falco is a very, his previous handler really loved obedience and she hammered it with him, so hands mean a lot to him. And that actually bit me when I got him because during our tracking, you know, we'd be going along and he'd be getting tangled in his leash, so I'd raise my hand like this, yeah, and then I'd bring it back down to keep tracking and I kept, I said to the master, I'm like, he lays down in the middle of all of his tracks. Why in the heck is he laying down in the middle of the track that is like 15 feet long and it, you know, has only been there for five minutes and she said, watch your hands. You're telling him to. <laughs> Do we have any more questions? What is the average, is the average length of time that a dog will stay with the company? Ten-ish years. Huh? Ten-ish years. Ten. So if he's three now, you would expect him six. to retire like at 14? No, he's six. He's six. He's six. He's six. He's six. <laughs> he's six. Okay. Next question. My son is three. <laughs> um, okay. I'm a retired teacher, and I had a canine police officer in my classroom one time. And he was talking to the kids, and he told us, this was in Minnesota, he told us that when, get, when they got a dog from another country trained in a different language, that they retrained the dog to English commands because the officer under stress is more likely to forget than the dog is more likely to so they depend on the dog's ability to translate more than they depend on the human's ability to stay stress-free enough to remember. How is, is it, does overstate lines, or do you have, any, have you ever heard of that before? <laughs> I've never heard that before. Um, maybe so. different departments do things differently. Uh, I will tell you that I find myself shouting at him in this language that means nothing to me more than I, you know, under stress because I'm trying to get him back out of whatever he's made his way into to get him back to me. Down in front. So I don't know, I think, you know, just like riding a bike, I guess. Maybe. Contrary, I don't know, I've never heard contrary that. Contrary to that, I heard a canine handler say that you use the foreign language because um, a bad guy can't probably give a command that your dog will obey. I guess, uh, yes, that's part of it. But the other thing is, if, one, if I told one of you his bite command, the likelihood that he's going to listen to you is slim to none. Um, even his old handler saw him recently and she told him to sit and he looked at her like, who are you? And he took off the other way. Um, at home, he, do I try and teach my kids the word bulligan? Actually, yes, it's very cute when a three-year-old shouts bulligan and pops him with his collar and away they go. But no, he, he is very unlikely to listen at this point to somebody else, especially if we're at work. Um, he knows all of our other handlers and we don't handle each other's dogs regularly, but we're around each other enough that I, I think if another handler came and was working with him, but again, there's a certain presence 
over a dog, and I think they can sense some of that where a lot of people see him and they're a little skeptical of him. You know, like, ah, I'm not sure if I want you to come near me, and I'm not sure if I want to have control over you. Um, so, no, I think you'd be hard-pressed. Would it happen? I don't know. But I think you'd be hard-pressed to find that somebody else is going to control him. So one more question. Following up on Joan's retirement question, how do you expect um, Falco to react when you plan to continue with one more canine before your retirement? I don't know. I don't know. Um, Jim Donald, one of our other handlers, did that recently. He had canine Johnny, and Johnny was like this, oh gosh, a complete crazy man. He was a, a full-bred Belgian Malinois, and he was nuts. And then he got canine Crowny, our rescue, and you'd see them, so he'd still bring him to work just to make him feel good about himself. <laughs> um, but then he'd come out to the car, and Crowny would have poor Johnny down on the floor just beating him up all day long. <laughs> this is my car now, get it, you know? So I don't know. I, I think he, everybody that I've talked to that's had to retire dogs say that dog sits in the window and is like, are you kidding? But a lot of our handlers have continued to bring their retired dogs with them or at least give them like field trip days to work, back to work. Uh, Johnny, Jim used to bring him out and let him do a little bite work session when he brought him to work, just like I said, to make him feel good about himself. But I don't know. I mean, I think they're bred to do this. And, and literally, some of them, until the day their handler says, enough is enough, you're, you know, you can't even get up anymore. Um, they, they love to do this. And you and I maybe don't want to go to work every day, but on his off days, he's miserable. And he terrorizes my house. So I like to go to work. Well, that's a good way to wrap it up. Yes. Right? Uh, anybody who can and is able um, can help us stack chairs on the trolleys. Don't just stack them, but put them on the trolleys. And uh, don't forget the puppies. And let's give Sarah another big round of applause.